Uh, namaste, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, so, yes. So, the topic of this, uh, today's discussion is Indic knowledge landscape uh, to look at the knowledge in terms of Vedic science to an audience that has been brought up mainly from a contemporary or modern perspective, right? And the idea is to get the most comprehensive bird's eye view so that before we venture into any particular stream of our interest, we know where to, uh, what is where, right? So that's the whole uh, purpose of this discussion. Uh, so we can start off with uh, the Mangala Shoka. Uh, Om Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahviryam Karavavahi, Tejasvinavadhita Mastu Mavidvishavahi, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Uh, so let us get some context. Uh, now, in the Indic perspective, the Vedas are considered to be the source of all knowledge. So there is a line from uh, the Manusmriti which says, Vedo Khilo Dharma Moolam, Smriti Shile Chatadvimam, Acharas Chaiva Sadhunatmana, Sushti Revacha. So what this says is the Vedas consist all the information related to the knowledge system. An entire knowledge system in the Indic perspective is derived directly or indirectly starting from the Vedas, be it the philosophical systems, be it the sciences. Uh, so we are going to look at how that has panned out. Now, before we move into that, let us understand what is the Indic way of learning because each system or each, uh, let's say each educational system has its own way or its own uh, processes that it follow. So the broad classification of learning uh, in the Indic system has been divided into three levels, right? One based on the kind of experience or the kind of learning it can be achieved through. Now, there are kalas, which are your applied sciences or your skills, everything within the art segment, your singing, dancing, uh, painting, uh, all these come as a kala, right? Now, the idea is that with more and more practice, you can get better at this. This is from abhyasa. You can get, uh, you know, uh, you can actually improve and practice on these skills. The next level is through adhyayana, which is where the pure sciences come into the uh, picture. This is where you can acquire knowledge or what we call as jnana. So the 14 Vidyasthanas, which are the foundations of the Indic knowledge repository, uh, comes within the category of uh, jnana. So this is something which we are going to closely look into in today's uh, talk, right? And then we have the highest level of uh, knowledge that is coming through uh, Anubhava. I mean, that's the mode of achieving that. It's through personal experience that you can gain this, uh, this kind of knowledge. Uh, it is called Upasana. And this is something that you can only experience. It, it cannot be, you know, um, just transferred uh, in, in the form of a text or maybe in a talk, etc., etc. Right? And this is called as Paravidya or uh, Brahmavidya. So this is a broad classification of uh, essentially the levels of learning that has been introduced into the Indic system. Now, before we move into the actual classification and the taxonomy, let us get a perspective of uh, what it takes for any student to understand uh, the Indic knowledge system. Are there any prerequisites or um, is there anything that you need to know beforehand before you go into the uh, knowledge system? And yes, there are certain things that as a, a student of uh, studying the, uh, the Vedic uh, corpus, you need to understand, uh, you know, so that you get a clear perspective of the context of the, uh, the knowledge system or the Shastic system that was actually introduced. The first thing that you need to understand, and this is something probably we are all aware of, uh, you know, uh, coming with an Indian, uh, I would say, you know, uh, culture, uh, that is the, the principles of Vedic living. We need to understand things like they had four Purusharthas as the, as the purposes of human life. Dhatma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. Yajna, for example, was central to the Vedic way of life. So a lot of knowledge systems and sciences evolved as a result of the kind of uh, principles or philosophy of life that existed during the time. Right. The second thing that is very critical to understanding uh, the essence or the, the actual teachings is definitely a working knowledge of Sanskrit. 
right? Because all the Shastric text and the literature is available in Sanskrit. Unfortunately, English doesn't really do justice to some of the the words and the uh, knowledge that exists there. There have been, you know, quite a few loose translations or interpretations of the original text, which pretty much suck the light life out of that, right? So for us to get the actual essence in detail, we need to understand the language in which it is written because without that it always you know knowledge will get lost in translation this is something that we have seen with a lot of texts as well uh, right and the third thing you need to understand is the structure of the shastric text uh, just like any research methodology paper or any research article will have a certain format right any experiment that you perform will have uh, you know the objective uh, the the process or the method and the inference etc the Shastric texts are written in a particular format, right? And this is something that we need to understand uh, before we actually understand what's the purport of it, writing from, you know, uh, the initiation or how the, the text is starting or what is the Prayojana of the text, who is the Adhikari, uh, what is the Vishaya of the text. So all these things are actually uh, mentioned at the start of the book and there are certain uh, formats uh, which becomes the part of the form of the Shastric text which becomes very critical for us to get a detailed understanding of the, uh, the Shastra, right? So that is also a prerequisite because without that, if we dive into it, we are not going to understand. The fourth thing that you need to understand is the, the way uh, the Shastric texts have been written in the uh, Sanskrit literature or the Vedic literature, right? That is the Shastra Siksha Paddhati. Now, our system was one of dialogue and conversation. Just to give you an example, so there used to be a sutra text. Uh, I can take the example of something which is very popular and a lot of you might have heard about it. Uh, that is your Panini's Ashtadhyayi. Now this is a sutra text which are precise uh, formula style uh, sutras that are listed out, extremely concise, extremely precise. Now for you to understand this in complete depth and with all the essence, just the sutras will not be enough. So we have, uh, you know, Patanjali's Mahabhashyam uh, on the Ashtadhyayi Sutras or the Vyakarana uh, Shastra. Now that details out the, it's a, it's a detailed commentary listing out and explaining each uh, sutra and in fact the use of each word, what does it mean? So all these things are listed out in the format of a Bhashya. And then we have follow up, you know, uh, Granthas like Vrittis or Vartikas uh, to interpret some of the texts or to add on some of the uh, or build upon some of the information which is already existent because during this time there might be some uh, opponents who might have raised some questions or objections towards uh, some of the claims that are made in these uh, sutra texts or the, even the bhashyas right so what we need to understand is this was a form of debate or i would say uh, discussion uh, in the format of dialogue that did not happen face to face but in text format right now if we get the understanding of this it takes us a long way into actually understanding the um the the flow of discussion because if we have missed something uh, of the relevance in the past then we are not going to get the true essence so that's the background information now we are actually going to uh, deep dive into the taxonomy and understand what is uh, the subject matter in terms of what are the sciences or what are these uh, disciplines that are available uh, in the Vedic uh, perspective and how they are relevant in today's contemporary uh, society, right? That is the Chaturdasha Vidyasthanam. Um, so we have this, uh, you know, uh, beautiful, uh, again, Sutra uh, from the Manusmriti. Angani Vedas Chatvaro Mimamsa Nyaya Vistaraha Dharma Shastam Puranam Cha Vidyas Cheti Chaturdasha. So the four Vedas, the six Vedangas, that is the limbs of the Vedas by which you can actually uh, grasp the meaning of the Vedas. Uh, then the four, uh, which includes Mimamsa, Nyaya, Dharma Shastam and Purana. So these uh, 14 complete the Chaturdasha Vidyasthanam, uh, which is the knowledge repository of the Indic knowledge system. Now within this as, as well, uh, I would add few more aspects and let's take a detailed look at what these things entail, right? So starting with the four Vedas, I think many of you might be aware of this, uh, the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur and the Atharva Veda. These are the four Vedas. 
and within each of these vedas we also have upavedas so ayurveda belongs to rigveda gandharva veda belongs to the sama veda which deals with mainly uh, aesthetics and you know uh, all these uh, aspects of it dhanur veda that deals with warfare uh, you know uh, military related aspects and then artha shastra belongs to the atharva veda which deals with economics polity public administration etc right now then there are the the six vedangas shiksha vyakarana nirukta chandas jyotisha and kalpa so what we are going to do as a part of this discussion is take a detailed look at each of these vedangas also we are going to take a detailed look at the six darshanas now i mentioned about the uh, mimamsa nyaya and dharma shastra and puranam so when we talk of mimamsa and nyaya shastra so nyaya combines nyaya and vaisheshika which becomes a pair of darshana uh, purva mimamsa and uttara mimamsa forms the mimamsa section both these uh, especially the the vedanta perspective also draws a lot of uh, i mean th there are certain elements that are borrowed from the sankhya and yoga philosophy and there are some things which have been opposed as well so the entire indic philosophy uh, draws a lot out of these philosophies as well so we have the shad darshanas that is the six uh, schools of indian philosophy so like i said we are going to look at the original context and the contemporary relevance uh, of these uh, knowledge systems but, but first let's look at the uh, the vedas we are not going to spend too much time on this particular aspect but just to give you an overview and there is some information which is there in the deck uh, which once you have the access to the file you can look into it so each of the vedas are divided or has four segments like each uh, you know beat rigveda samaveda atharveda yajurveda each of them have samithas they have brahmanas they have an aranyaka section and they have an upan uh, upanishad section so the samhita section is the mantra portion of the vedas this contains the actual hymns right which are presented in the metrical form right or chandas what we call as right and then there are the brahmanas so by volume brahmanas uh, form a major part of the uh, the vedas these mainly deal with all the ritualistic part of the vedas uh, which consists of uh, how the ritual should be performed you know uh, all the integrities of that what ingredients to use or what kind of procedures to follow all this would be part of the the brahmana section then we have the aranyakas which has content similar to the brahmana section but the main a uh, perspective of aranyaka is to look at yajna from a philosophical perspective right so this was typically for those people who uh, you know uh, were nearing towards old age or retirement and when they actually need to contemplate on the philosophical aspects of the uh, the yajna so the karma part of uh, the vedas and then there were the upanishads that were the you know uh, the deepest of philosophy uh, for philosophies of Uh, the vedas are discussed here and it actually contains the essence of uh, vedic teaching right so this is what uh, the the structure of the vedas actually is right now i do have uh, amit mohoreya and uh, you know couple of other people who are helping me out answer any of the question that might come in the chat section we will also make allocation for a certain amount of time at the end Uh, to take up some of the questions uh, just letting you know because i i saw that there are some of the questions in the chat um, right so just wanted to let you guys know updated on this part uh, then the other thing is moving forward with the uh, the discussion now once the vedas are there as a part of the chaturdasha vidyasthanas then we move on to the vedangas shiksha kalpo vyakaranam niruktam chandasam chaya ज्योतिषम मानस्चैव वेदांगानि षडेवतु सो दीस आर द सिक्स वेदांगास नाउ इन एसेंस द वेदांगास आर द टूल्स और इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स बाय व्हिच द वेदास कैन बी अंडरस्टूड राइट नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू स्पेंड कपल ऑफ मिनट्स ऑन दिस पर्टिकुलर स्लाइड जस्ट टू हेल्प यू गाइस अंडरस्टैंड द द द एग्जीक्यूटिव और द द एग्जीक्यूशन एक्सीलेंस ऑफ आवर एंसेस्टर्स so the way this was structured was the vedangas was structured was with an inter uh, with an uh, intention to interpret preserve and execute the um, the discussion or basically the uh, the mantras and the other aspect that was related to the vedas so the know how that is your you know uh, the authenticity of content 
and then the preservation uh, of the form of the content and then the execution steps all were kept intact so that even after uh, you know millennia we are still able to access the nodic uh, the vedic knowledge in its true sense right so when we look at how each of the vedangas played a role when it comes to authenticity or correctness of uh, meaning right nirupta and vyakarana played a very important role this was from the standpoint of uh, content then from the standpoint of preservation of uh, preservation of usage and form we had shiksha and uh, chandas come into this picture right and from an execution standpoint that is how to perform the yaga or when to perform the yaga so jyotisha played the or answer the question of when to perform and how to perform was taken up in the um, the kalpa section right so like i said we are going to take a detailed look at each of this uh, both with a uh, ancient or the uh, the original perspective context and then the uh, the contemporary one right starting with shiksha so in uh, what what exactly shiksha shiksha was actually created with an intention to uh, the protect the vedic pronunciation so this is one factor that is critical and this is un- incomparable with any other i would say form of uh, knowledge system that exists the vedic system gives primal importance to uh, the pronunciation or the modulation everything from how the sound is produced the origin the tone pitch what is the duration for which even a single syllable is actually to be mentioned how much effort to put into that all that actually uh, is taken into consideration because at the heart of it the vedic philosophy believes that everything is a manifestation of vibrations and sound in essence deals a lot with uh, is because of the vibrations the sound is produced right so each and every sound that is produced is considered to have a long lasting or an everlasting uh, effect so that is the ideology or the philosophy behind this now uh, in modern context when we look at a uh, shiksha so what we would say is this is the field that deals with phonetics right so just to give you a little bit of a background uh, you might be you might be having this because you know shiksha is a very common term that we use right the actual meaning of shiksha is instruction so here it refers to instruction in reciting reciting the vedic hymns right and everything else comes into the a uh, picture so phonetics is essentially a branch of uh, linguistics that uh, studies how humans actually perceive sounds right so when you look at modern uh, modern phonetics for example um, you know uh, we 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 understand today that you know the the sound coming from various parts of the throat etc so all this have been actually discussed in detail both in the shiksha and also uh, a part of it in the the vyakarana shastra right Uh, now the way i have structured this presentation in the talk is that uh, each of the vedangas we are going to look at initially the original context then we are going to look at the modern uh, or the contemporary relevance or the field or discipline of study and on the right hand side i made a note of what are some of the uh, essential books for you to get started with any of the shastric texts so these are the sources that you can refer to right so this is how the uh, the presentation has been designed so that it will be easy for you to follow once the uh, deck has been shared so uh, paninya shiksha uh, yagna valkya shiksha these are some of the important books uh, within the uh, the shiksha segment right and then comes a very very uh, big block uh, which has become i would say the center of uh, sanskrit studies in in modern uh, society at least uh, that is vyakarana now to be very honest with you uh, it would be a little bit of uh, an injustice to actually translate vyakarana is just grammar uh, so vyakarana is actually much more than grammar uh, right it also deals with the philosophy of grammar uh, so that is that is a major difference so uh, that is something i would like all of you to understand so vyakriyante vibhichya pradarshyante anena shabdah iti vyakarana so uh, i think this is taken from patanjali's mahabhashyam where he describes what vyakarana is or this is how it defines it so it's a discipline that deals with the study and analysis of language so how you do it vivikriyante vivichyante and then basically breaking down the words into uh, breaking down the sentences into words and even the words into root forms prefixes suffixes 
uh, which which are going to give you useful insights on the meaning of the word and the usage of the words. Uh, just to give you a, a snippet of information, so Panini lists out I think close to four thousand rules in his Ashtadhyayi, uh, you know, uh, which which forms the foundation of uh, Sanskrit grammar. Now there are close to two thousand dhatus, which are the root forms uh, basis which all the words in Sanskrit are arriving out of. So by the combination of dhatus with various types of prefixes and suffixes in various different combinations, uh, we can form pretty much you know um, infinite number of words or at least lakhs and crores of words, right? So that is the extent of uh, computation, uh, computational beauty that exists in Panini's Ashtadhyayi. And for him to have the um, the intellect to you know structure uh, the language such that you know uh, you can you can cover anything within either Vedic Sanskrit or even from the Sanskrit literature uh, by using the you know the rules that is given in Astadhyay. It's 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 a marvel that even stands the test of time. Uh, and even a lot of Western scholars and linguists uh, appreciate the kind of work that has gone into uh, the Astadhyay. In the modern context, when we look at this, uh, linguistics is the modern discipline. So everything from, let's say, your natural language processing, uh, how uh, you know the new words are, are formed. See, one of the challenges in natural language processing, especially when it comes to a language like English, is that uh, the the sequence of words in a particular sentence is very important. Uh, the second thing is uh, it doesn't take into into consideration um the other aspects like you know let's say if a new word comes into picture right so sanskrit uh, the way it is designed uh, it, it's one of the best languages uh, if not the best for natural language processing systems so a lot of work is currently uh, going on from this perspective in modern uh, you know uh, modern contemporary uh, you know circles to actually add to this right so that would be a perspective from uh, uh, from the uh, vyakarana side of things so Ashtadhyayi, Mahabhashyam and Vakyapadiyam by Bhattachari, these are some of the important texts here. Uh, moving on to uh, Nirukta. So Nirukta, uh, written by uh, Yaska, uh, deals with the protection of semantics of the Vedas. So it deals with why a particular word has been used. So if, like I told you in the previous segment of Vyakarana, one word can have multiple prefixes and suffixes. And maybe the way it is formed, the same word can actually mean different things just by the way you break it down. So Yaska actually dealt with what is called as Nigunta, which is a list of, um, you know, all the words that were used in the Vedas and then gave a list of how uh, or what each of the word means. Right. So a lot of uh, contemporary linguistic ideas, etymology. So this is the science of etymology is what you can say. Right. Arriving at the meaning of the words. Uh, right and theories of origin of words from you know verb or noun roots, uh, interpretations of the same expressions, hermeneutics. So these are all, uh, I would say, modern disciplines where Nirukta has a very very important role. Uh, unfortunately, I do not think in the Sanskrit literature a lot of uh, texts are available today because we've not been able to preserve them or we've not been able to have the translations available. Uh, but whatever we have is still very, very important from a conceptual standpoint for us to get an understanding. Even something like, you know, Greek philosophers like Plato, uh, he believed in the concept of uh, onomatopoeia, uh, which is basically um, words are just, uh, you know, phonetical uh, imitations of something that we hear or maybe, uh, you know, uh, just sounds, right? Uh, Yaska did not completely approve of this. He said that is one way but words can be derived uh, from other levels as well. So what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, linguistic related aspects and theory of origin of uh, words and language that actually can be looked at uh, from the Nirukta perspective, right? Moving forward to the next Vedanga, uh, which is a Chandas. So uh, when you talk of Chandas, Again, this is something a lot of you might be aware. Uh, you might have heard something called as the Gayatri Chandas or you know uh, Anushtup Chandas. So these are some of the popular ones. So Chandas is a science of meters or prosody, right? This was created with an intention to protect the Vedic oral text, right? 
So it provides detail on the type of meters used in the construction of uh, various hymns, right? Uh, now we have to understand again the context. Now today, if, if we want to, you know, uh, if we have an email, we have a password protected, uh, you know, a system to even handle our laptops and mobile phones, etc. But back in the day, that was not the case. So they had to still create a system by which knowledge is being preserved and people who are using that knowledge are able to identify when there is an error, uh, right? So the way this was done was by uh, using what we know as uh, chandas, right? Um, so just to give you an example, right? So there's uh, a very famous uh, chandas that is in place of, that might appear to be in, in, you know, in the place of Lord Krishna that actually comes to an estimate of pi, uh, right? So this is something that you can actually uh, do a little bit of research upon. Uh, and this is what we call as maybe packaging. So what used to happen is um, when, when there is um, the syllables not matching the particular chandas in which the hymn is written, then they are able to identify that there's an error and there needs to be a fix that needs to be made, right? So it was a system by which people could identify errors and preserve the actual source of the knowledge, right? So a lot of mathematical concepts, combinatrix, uh, binary numbers have been actually actually attributed towards the Chanda Shastra. And a lot of study can be done towards this, uh, you know, uh, doing here. Uh, so I, I told you this, this is reference of uh, the Shloka, uh, Gopi Bhagya Madhura Tata, uh, Shikni Shodhana Sandhiga. So this is a particular Shotra and there's uh, another line as well, which actually, uh, from the Katapayadi system, which is what uh, is the um, the source of Vedic mathematics as we know it today, uh, right? Is giving a, a estimate of pi to up to I think thirty one digits, right? Each of the letters, uh, each of the syllables is assigned a particular numeric, right? And that numeric, uh, when you actually do the uh, you know substitute them, um, right? It actually gives you an estimate of pi. Now, like I said, this was a system of encryption what you can call uh, in the uh, the vedic uh, traditions uh, right uh, so Ch chanda sutras is pretty much uh, you know uh, was actually written by pingala and we have a lot of work from katyayana as well uh, in this particular uh, discipline moving forward uh, the next one uh, a very very uh, i would say maybe an interesting field uh, maybe slightly misunderstood field as well that is uh, jyotisha uh, Jyotisha is arriving out of the word, uh, out of the word Jyotish, uh, which stands for light. So this is essentially the science of light or what we know as stars and planetary objects, celestial bodies, right? So, uh, you know, there's a particular, you know, shloka which says, Yatha shikha mayurana naga nam manneyo yatha tada vedanga shastana ganitam murthi vartate now, this shloka actually gives us an understanding of how important Ganita, Ganita or Jyotisha, you know, they are used uh, synonymously. Uh, mathematics and Jyotisha Shastra were pretty much, you know, uh, combined as one. And the high esteem that our ancestors held for mathematics, right? Just like how uh, a snake has the money on the, the forehead, uh, right? Uh, and the shikha is there on the uh, peacock. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, position they gave Jyotisha in the entire system. Now, why was Jyotisha and Ganita given uh, so much importance? Now, let me make one thing very clear. Uh, Jyotisha that we're talking about here is not talking about the, the Palita Jyotisha, that is predictive Jyotisha. This Vedanga Jyotisha concerns itself with uh, knowledge of space and time, right? Uh, this was with an, it was with an intention that um, any karya or any Vedic ritual should be done at an auspicious time, right? So that was the purpose of the, uh, the Vedanga Jyotisha. So in order for them to do this, they had to keep track and, uh, you know, uh, notes of the movements of celestial bodies uh, and calculate all this, right? So this is where we have the modern day astronomy, meteorology, all comes into the picture in this particular segment. Uh, you know, there's 
there are multiple examples of discoveries and instances of uh, Indian astronomy or Jyotisha being extremely advanced or ahead of its time compared to the, the modern perspective. This is a classic example uh, which uh, I would like to share about the, the Arundhati Vashishta Nakshatra, which is a twin star, uh, star system. So much before you know, even telescopes were discovered, uh, our ancestors actually had knowledge of uh, a twin star system that is in, in the Indian uh, system, we call it Arundhati Vashishta system, which I think in a lot of marriage ceremonies, uh, you see you know, uh, the groom pointing the finger of the bride and showcasing that yeah, this is the Arundhati and Vashishta uh, Nakshatra. So typically, you know, what is the significance of this? Now, typically in most twin star, uh, star systems, what we see is that uh, the one, one star has higher gravitational force and it has a fixed base and the other one rotates around it. Like how, for example, the Earth rotates around the sun, right? But the, the speciality of this system is that uh, they rotate around each other in a uh, synchronized manner. Uh, there's not one fixed position. So, you know, they combine that with the idea of a married life as well, that, you know, both husband and wife should actually pretty much, you know, uh, be in sync all the time and, you know, not that one should be dominant or the other, etc. something like that. So this was a beautiful concept of identifying or mixing science with our day-to-day -day lives. Now, this is what uh, the entire Vedic philosophy can be summarized with just this one example. They had a scientific level of knowledge and they actually used it in a way to implement or integrate with a day-to-day -day life as well. Uh, we also had, you know, advanced knowledge of the occurrence of, uh, of eclipses, the positions of uh, celestial bodies, so the distance between, uh, you know, Earth and Moon, Earth and Sun, etc. So it was, it was a highly advanced uh, science. Uh, but again, like I said, a lot of the knowledge has been lost in the last millennia or so. Uh, we have some very famous works uh, in Jyotisha, you know, like uh, Varamihira's Vrith uh, Samhita, Arya Bhatia Siddhanta, uh, Surya Siddhanta, uh, right? So all these are some of the uh, very important works. So anything with respect to even I would say, you know, astronomy, even mathematics to a certain extent would be covered within the uh, Jyotisha segment. And then we have what is called as uh, Kalpa, uh, which was basically an operations manual. Uh, if you guys recollect, uh, in the earlier part, I said that Yajna was central to the Vedic way of life. So in Yajna, what happened was we have to answer a lot of questions like who is going to perform the Yajna? What is the benefits of the Yajna? What ingredients do I need? When should I perform the Yajna? Uh, who should be the, the people who will actually help perform that Yajna? So there are multiple questions that might arise out of your mind uh, in, in respect to the performance of Yajna. So, Kalpa as a system was an operations manual that dealt with the procedures of this, right? Now, again, I would like to give you how this actually resulted in a lot of um, scientific discovery or knowledge that, you know, um, our ancestors were able to derive by this simple performance of uh, Yajna. So in the Yajna system, uh, there are different types of altars or different shapes of altars or in which the yajna was performed some were square uh, some were circular some were triangular right now there is this uh, there is this uh, you know rule that they had to follow uh, in certain yajnas where if they are performing the one on a square one or a circular one the area of that the altar where the home has to be performed has to be equal now the area of a circular and a square uh, shape can only be, you know, uh, calculated to precision by the knowledge of uh, the value of pi, right? So Indians had approximately 18 estimates uh, for the value of pi, uh, right? Much ahead of its time uh, in terms of modern mathematics, right? So what I'm essentially trying to tell you here is maybe the context or uh, the application that some of these knowledge uh, that existed were used for a different purpose back then, uh, mainly with, I would say, you know, the uh, ritualistic or the performance of Yajna. Uh, but there is, there was still a lot of scientific knowledge available, which could be used uh, in a lot of different areas in the modern, con uh, modern context as well, right? Uh, it, it requires a talent and effort and time from our end uh, to pretty much get into the system, understand uh, what they talk about and then 
figure out a way of how we can utilize it in the, the modern context as well. Uh, even there are instances of, uh, you know, Baudhayana, uh, who, uh, who is already, uh, who had actually uh, given the Pythagoras theorem uh, much before Pythagoras, right? Again, the application of what Pythagoras theorem, uh, you know, uh, does to what Baudhayana used it for was different. That was more from a uh, yajna perspective, but it was still there. The knowledge was still there, uh, right? So that's the context. So pretty much uh, we come to the conclusion of yeah. the, the first part of the discussion that is dealing with the, uh, yeah. the Vedangas. Uh, now we move on to another very, very uh, interesting aspect. Uh, again, something, uh, you know, uh, which is again, which I find to be very, very interesting. That is the Darshanas, uh, the six schools of Indian philosophy. Uh, I know that, you know, we are getting a lot of comments. I hope, you know, uh, they are being answered. If not, we'll, we'll uh, you know, definitely take them up in the end uh, because there's still quite a lot to cover uh, and, and, you know, a lot of effort and research has gone into uh, putting this uh, talk prepared. Uh, so I would like to cover them as much as possible, uh, right? Uh, yeah. So in, in, with respect to the Darshana, so I would like to, you know, uh, share this particular, uh, you know, uh, shloka, which is, which is very, very uh, essential or integral to uh, this entire uh, system. Pagya vivekam labate vibhinnagama darshanaihi kiyadva shakyate munyetum swayatna munudhavata. So what it says is only when you understand when you read, understand, and contemplate using various different perspectives, different lenses on any particular idea or concept or knowledge, are you able to truly understand its essence? And then only you are able to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. Right? If you look at six, for maybe for one person it looks as six, for the other person it might look as nine. Right? He's right in his sense. So we need to understand anything from various perspectives before concluding uh, and arriving at a conclusion because we cannot experience or learn everything just by our experiences because we have a limited set of experiences. So this was the thought process only by, you know, uh, taking in knowledge from various different perspectives, we are able to arrive at the truth. So the classification of Indian philosophy can be broadly classified into uh, two kinds of systems. Uh, you know, please do not, I would put a, you know, maybe a disclaimer, uh, please do not, you know, mistake it uh, by the naming of it as Astika and Nastika as, um, you know, um, orthodox and unorthodox, although that is the terms that they use. Essentially, it's, it, does, it has not, got nothing to do with belief in God or not, uh, because that's the common translation of Astika and Nastika. Here it refers to Astika Darshanas are the ones that accept the authority of the Vedas, right? Nastika are the ones that do not accept the authority of the Vedas. So in this section, we have Jainism, Buddhism, and the Charvaka, or what we call in the modern day as the materialistic uh, philosophy, uh, right? Uh, let me, you know, live my life to the fullest. And when I uh, die, and that's the end of it, right? That's the kind of philosophy that exists there. Today's talk, we are focusing more on the, the six uh, Astika Darshanas. Like I said, it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, the existence or acceptance of God per se, because Something like Purva Mimamsa does not accept uh, the entity of God. Uh, Samkhya system, uh, did, uh, I mean, it started off as a Nireshwara system that also did not, uh, does not accept a uh, system called of Ishwara or God or anything of that sort. Right? So that's, that's the idea. So we have these six schools, Samkhya, Yoga, they form a pair because they draw close parallels with each other. Nyaya Vaisheshika, that's another pair. And then we have the Pura Mimamsa and the Uttar Mimamsa. That's again a pair, right? So we have three pairs and six philosophies. So we're going to again take a look at, uh, you know, some salient features because to, to actually get a detailed understanding of each of this could actually take a session. Uh, so we're just going to, you know, touch upon the overview, uh, get a little bit of a flavor of what they stand for, what, uh, what relevance is there and how we can utilize that. Okay. So the word Sankhya actually is derived from the word Sankhya, uh, which means number. Uh, you might, some of you might be Hindi speaking, might be already aware of this. So another meaning also is there of Sankhya, which is Samya Khyati, that is right knowledge. So this, uh, so one thing before we move into any philosophical system is we have to understand that the philosophical 
inquiry towards truth uh, or knowledge uh, right now we have to any any philosophy has to answer questions like what is knowledge uh, who who is the knowledge meant for how is he going to get the knowledge or you know um what what are the you know uh, tools for acquiring that knowledge etc etc right and each of the philosophical systems is built upon certain presuppositions uh, which we call as their world view based on it uh, the world view of the particular uh, philosophy is built so sankhya is a, a philosophical system that postulates a system of duality that believes in the existence of two independent entities in the universe so in other words uh, sankhya philosophy is one of the oldest and one of the earliest philosophies uh, evolutionary philosophies of the world it had a revolutionary philosophy that it put forward uh, that believed in a concept of two entities of purusha uh, and prakriti uh, right and it in uh, enlists about 25 uh, principles of evolution in the universe uh, this include everything from mahat uh, ahankara uh, buddhi and then you have the the pancha mahabhutas the tanmatras the karmendriyas gyanendriyas uh, right so it totally comes up to 25 elements uh, also one of the key contributions of sankhya uh, philosophy is uh, the uh, the idea that prakriti is made up of trigunas sattva rajas and tamas uh, right a lot of other philosophies uh, in the indic system you know uh, borrow this particular thing from sankhya ayurveda for example borrows from this even vedanta accepts this uh, right so a lot of various systems have accepted this uh, particular concept of uh, sankhya in modern context uh, sankhya like i said is the foundational system on which health and wellness uh, aspects like you know yoga or ayurveda are built they they draw heavily from the uh, the initial concept that is put forth in the sankhya philosophy uh, right so this is this is a very important contribution a lot of study can be done starting with the sankhya sutra so uh, kapila uh, you know there's a very popular uh, you know work of sankhya karika by ishwar krishna which is available a very very concise precise text but extremely informative uh, right it also uh, even even aspects of modern psychology uh, could actually be uh, studied within the sankhya segment uh, the first thing that it lists out is it enumerates three types of pain uh, you know uh adhyatmika adi bautika and uh, adi daivika uh, right so there's a very detailed uh, explanation of how to overcome this etc uh, etc et right so like i said any uh, psychology aspects or you know uh, well being health and wellness uh, rely highly on the sankhya philosophy in the modern context uh, then we have a very popular uh, philosophy and you know this is a philosophy that is in vogue for sure uh, in today's society that is the yoga uh we can term it vedic psychology but i would say it's much more than just psychology uh so we have the famous uh, yoga sutras of patanjali uh that that forms the sutra text uh, of this particular uh, discipline uh, there's there are also multiple books available like yoga bhashya of uh, vyasa gheranda samhita uh, yoga vashishta hatha yoga hatha yoga padipika etc etc so in patanjali yoga sutras patanjali describes yoga as Uh, yoga chitta uh, chitta vritti nirodha uh, that is uh, it is a, a a discipline that helps you control or sees the modifications of the mind basically chitta vrittis that is the modifications of the uh, the mind right and how you can attain that is what is being described in the uh, the yoga shastra in today's scenario we see more focus shifted towards the asana side of uh, the yoga uh, but to be very honest that's maybe only about a 10 15 20 percent part of uh, the entire yogic thought process or philosophy right uh, more uh, the the uh, the actual yogic philosophy deals more on the aspect of mind uh, and the mental side of things uh, right the various types of yogic practices you know yama niyamas asanas pranayama which is your you know control of uh, breathing uh, then they have mudras bandhas uh, right uh, dhyana meditation there the multiple types like i said uh, today we we are focusing more on the the flexibility uh, side of things or the you know the physical side of things to the asanas uh, but there are equally important uh psychological uh, physiological and other aspects health related wellness related uh, 
mental health related aspects that actually can derive a lot from the the yoga shastras uh, right so because the essence of yoga is to bring in um, balance of health not just physically but also mentally emotionally and spiritually right that is the actual essence of uh, yoga yoga so in modern context uh, any study that you are doing on psychology uh, cognitive thinking consciousness so this would all come under the purview of the the yoga shastra uh, right there have been plenty of research uh, you know on uh, the impact of you know uh, the yoga or meditation into um, into the, the productivity of people or the, the mental health of improvement in mental health of people etc etc right so this is this this is a subject that has vast scope um, and a lot of uh, interesting uh, aspects to deal with even something related to the states of dreaming uh, etc would fall within the purview of uh, the yoga shastra uh, right um, so this is this is a very very uh, interesting field that has rightly been recognized uh but again you know not just the the physical side of yoga but also the mental and the psychological aspects of yoga is something uh that one can actually access through the study of the yoga shastras once uh, we've taken a look at the the sankhya yoga the pair now let's look at the next pair that is your nyaya vaisheshika system so within this nyaya is a system of indic logic and reasoning niyate vivikshatatha anena iti nyaya uh, the other line also that talks about nyaya is pramanai pramanayatha parikshanam nyaya that is one that can be proved by pramana right so the nyaya sutra is also called as tarka shastra uh, tarka can be like you know a debate uh, a vada you know any of these terms also you can use basically by logic that you can arrive at the the conclusion is what is tarka shastra right and is so basically the nyaya sutra is designed to perform critical examination of aspects of knowledge uh, using logical proof so this looks at like the epistemology of things uh, right what is this so it asks questions like what is the source of knowledge uh, who is the knower what is the method of knowing etc the pramanas uh, you know so the pramanas become a very very important aspect so nyaya school typically accepts four pramanas uh, pratyaksha anumana upamana uh, uh, right uh, all all these aspects are actually uh, accepted by the the nyaya school right so it when the focus is on uh, the the method of knowing uh, it doesn't delve on what is the nature of knowledge it even questions things like you know existence of god or afterlife etc etc there are multiple debates that happen that happen in nyaya and these are you know uh, these are discussions or debates that has been happening for millennia uh, not just you know for a day or two right uh, you know there have been bashyas vartikas tikas the written one, you know back and forth to have these discussions uh, right so it does not delve into the nature of the knowledge but it focuses on how you arrive at the knowledge so the process is more important than the result because the idea is if you follow the process then the result will be there so it's a very very process oriented uh, system of knowledge uh, right so it looks at metaphysics epistemology in modern sense right the beautiful treatises of logic and argumentation uh, you know and establishing evidence that has been discussed in the nyaya shastras Uh, right so some of the famous books tarka sangraha of annam batta uh, and the nyaya sutras of uh, you know gautama these are some of the preliminary books so there's a particular link that i have shared uh, this is to give you an idea you can you can refer to it later on as well uh, of this system of vada or debate that existed in our um, in our uh, tradition right it's unfortunate that we feel that uh, we were a very closed uh, you know society that had you know everything is like superstition or presumptions uh, but that was not the case uh, we had a very very active uh, you know questioning mechanism uh, in our system uh, so you can actually uh, go through this article that talks about how vada actually happened in fact there's a very detailed um, process or the method in which uh, avada happened you know there are hetus that you have to give that are reasons backing up any claim that you make and an open opponent can actually question or you know 
um, basically he can bring uh, bring in or showcase hetva bhasas, what we call as hetva bhasas or false logic, right? If you show a particular logic which is not uh, true, then he can definitely you know uh, question that, catch hold of that, and uh, basically win the debate or uh, you know win the argument. So I don't want to use the term argument. I would rather say debate because the essence in our scriptures or in our literature was not to win. It was about arriving at the right source of knowledge or truth, right? So even the loser never felt that he lost, but he felt that, okay, you know, this was a means for them to arrive at the right means of knowledge. So beautiful treatises of logic are, are there in the Nyaya Shastra. Uh, moving on to the Vaisheshika system, uh, which got combined or integrated into Nyaya, I think around the 12th, 13th century, B, uh, you know, AD. Um, right. So, you know, that's in other only, you know, uh, 12th, 13th century, uh, it, it got combined with the Nyaya Shastra. So, Vaisheshika system deals with ontology, which is basically classifying the world into various objects, categories, and their relations, or what uh, it's known as padarthas. Right. So, uh, there are seven padarthas that is being accepted by the, the Navya Nyaya system, um, that is the, the latest or the new Nyaya uh, system. So, the word Vaisheshika is derived from the term Vishesha which essentially deals with the uh, explanation of what is vishesha that is a specific or a, uh, the the aspect that gives individuality to a particular object right so that is what is being discussed in vishesha so when you look at it from a modern context right con con concepts and topics related to atomicity space time uh, anything physics related, uh, so to speak, right, is actually discussed in great detail in the, uh, the Vaisheshika philosophy, right? So your modern day physics, particle physics, etc. Uh, come in uh, as, as, a, as a, you know, part of this study. So if you are someone that is very interested towards uh, physics as a field, then this is something that, uh, you know, uh, you can definitely get into. Uh, because that's the level of depth that was discussed by Kanada and his uh, Vaisheshika Sutras and also uh, Prashastapada. Uh, who wrote a bhashya on the sutras, uh, right? So there are a couple of uh, reference uh, articles that I've shared, which I found very interesting on the web. Uh, you know, you can go through these publications and understand uh, the context, even from a uh, contemporary perspective, uh, what are the, some of the uh, knowledge that actually existed and how we can actually mine them and uh, use it for contemporary, um, you know, relevance or, you know, uh, studies, right? Moving to the next uh, pair in the uh, Indic philosophy, uh, you know, uh, systems. Uh, again, a very, very beautiful uh, philosophy that is Purva Mimamsa or uh, Indian hermeneutics. Uh, so Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa came into uh, relevance when questions were raised by uh, towards the authority of the Vedas uh, and the rituals, ritualistic nature. Um, of the system to preserve and interpret the context of Vedic knowledge is where they came into the picture, right? Like I said, the Vedic system was quite ritualistic in nature, or what we call as the uh, uh, the karmas, right? Performing yajna uh, and you know um, your uh, samskaras, etc. Uh, right? All these played a very very central role. So. There were definitely questions faced uh, by uh, some of the, you know, uh, the, the later philosophers on Jainism or Buddhism that came into being. So, Purva Mimamsa became a beautiful uh, science of interpretation of the Vedic texts, uh, right? So, initially, they started off uh, as a discipline that interpreted the Vedas uh, using what is called as the Adhikarana Paddhatis. There are over a thousand Adhikaranas. So Adhikarana is, uh, you know, um, a system where different sutras or different mantras are clubbed together uh, based on Vishaya, Samshaya, Pudha Paksha, Uttara Paksha and Siddhanta. So Vishaya is the topic of discussion, right? And then there's a Samshaya. On a particular topic, a question or a doubt is uh, existent because of which there's, uh, you know, uh, questions being raised, which is your Pudha Paksha view. And based on that, you have to defend uh, your uh, thoughts or basically Pudha Mimamsa defended the Vedas in, in this particular case, right? So 
you can imagine uh, the kind of questions that that were uh, that might have been raised and the the beauty of the system to answer these questions in a very methodological uh, logical rational way uh, gave this uh, philosophy uh, or gave this system to be a perfect one for discourse analysis uh, right you can you can interpret uh, even vast volumes of books you can actually summarize it into maybe a one line statement even something like a mahabharata or ramayana or any shastric book right can be summarized into a one line statement if you follow the systems that have been described in the mimamsa sutras uh, right and later what happened was they were not just used in interpret uh, interpreting uh, the vedas but the concepts are being used to interpret the other texts of philosophy grammar etc etc so it has a universal kind of application uh, there is a very famous retired supreme court uh, judge uh, mr markande kadju right uh, who drew upon mimamsa principles in quite a few of his uh, judgments uh, right um, you know you can you can go through some of the articles there's plenty of it available in the uh, the public domain as well uh, right so there are there are like i said you know very beautiful uh, you know adhikaranas uh, you know that that is part of this one particular example that i can give uh, i believe it was about a particular uh, person who Who lost one limb and uh, you know one one leg and one hand, uh, right? Uh, in a manufacturing unit, but the insurance company was not uh, paying the insurance because the contract said that either you should lose both limbs or both hands, right? So using Mimamsa principles, he was able to draw out that the the purpose of this was, uh, you know, the purpose of mentioning something like this is because if you lose two legs, still you could you know maybe do some. Uh, office level, you can you can you know uh, sit in a chair and maybe you can perform an administrative level task, uh, right? But if you lose again, you know both uh, arms, you know uh, again it's difficult. But you know you could you could take up some other thing. That's you you can't take up some other thing. That's why you could uh, draw the uh, insurance. But it's in essence losing one leg and one arm is pretty much same as losing both legs or both arms, right? So that's the kind of argument um, or the Siddhanta, the conclusion that you know uh, Justice uh, Markande Kadri was able to derive out of the uh, the Mimamsa based on the Mimamsa principles. Uh, so very interesting uh, stuff. And then we have the the Uttara part. That is uh, so the Mimamsa deals with the Karma Khand of the Yoga. That is your earlier we discussed about the structure of the Vedas. That is Samhitas, Brahmanas, Aranyakas, and Upanishads. So Samhitas, Brahmanas, and Aranyakas come under the Uh, the karma kanda that is dealing with the ritualistic side of things so mimamsa deals with that so uttar mimamsa or uh, vedanta uh, deals with the um, the the gyana kanda of the the uh, the vedas that is the upanishads right so it starts the brahma sutras of uh, badarayana starts with the statement athatu dhamma jigyasa the one who is desires to know the brahman is for whom this actually discourse is meant for right so vedanta just you can make out by the word uh, the veda means knowledge uh, and then anta means towards the end right a culmination so vedanta translates pretty much to the culmination of the process of knowledge or gaining the highest source of uh, knowledge right so more uh, philosophical um, spiritual aspects of uh, you know uh, the vedas are described in the, the vedanta section Uh, there are various classifications again you know uh, one thing that i would like to highlight here is from the perspective of um, the the openness of or the freedom of thinking that was there in the indic system that within the vedanta itself there are multiple schools uh, that actually you know draw different conclusions and even oppose each other on certain aspects of it we have the advaita school of uh, you know Uh, Vedanta, that is non-dualism of Shankara. Uh, again, this is this. When you talk of Vedanta, most people identify Advaita Vedanta as Vedanta, but we have multiple other schools of Vedanta as well. There is Vishistha Advaita, the school of qualified non-dualism of Ramanuja. There is Dvaita, the school of dualism of Madhva. Uh, there is also Shuddha Advaita, Chintya Veda Veda. There are multiple schools. So these are all. Uh, philosophies that actually had back and forth discussions against one another to arrive at the uh, the conclusion, right? 
in modern context a lot of uh, you know uh, eminent scientists have actually you know drawn parallels of quantum mechanics and physics with uh, the concepts of vedanta and also the uh, the studies of the consciousness right so this is also something which is being done in the modern uh, or the contemporary society with respect to the uh, the vedanta right so we are coming to the final leg of our discussion that is the upavedas and others so the first two lines is something that we already covered angani veda satvaro mimamsa nyaya vistara puranam dharma shastram cha vidya hetas chaturdasha so there's another two lines which is a part of the vishnu puranam which says ayurvedo dhanurvedo gandharvedo gandharvascha tetvaya artha shastram chaturtam tu vidya krishta dashaivata so this deals with the upaveda side of things so we're going to look at three of them and then we are going to conclude our talk starting with a very very important aspect that is ayurveda it is science of life right so the the term ayurveda consists of two words ayu and veda ayu uh, translates to life in fact it is uh, derived from a root word of uh, gati or gat in gata uh right from sanskrit which means movement so movement of air is one of the translations that you could make so as long as there's movement of air there is life right so that is one of the ways of uh, translate uh, there there maybe couple of other interpretations as well so sushruta uh, in his sushruta samhita he uh, describes ayurveda as samadosha samagnischa samadhatu malatriya prasannatmendriya manah स्वस्थ इति अभिधीयते राइट सो बैलेंस अक्रॉस दोषास अक्रॉस धातुस मल्ला क्रिया ऑल दी मल्ला क्रिया ऑल दीस थिंग्स इस व्हाट इस डिफाइन्ड एस अ स्टेट ऑफ स्वस्थ राइट हेल्थ इट्स नॉट जस्ट फिजिकल हेल्थ इट्स वी हेल्थ कंसीडरिंग ऑल अदर एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ आर लाइफ इज वेल राइट and the the uh, important aspect of ayurveda is that it's not just limited to medicine uh, maybe the modern audience thinks that ayurveda is some medicines or maybe it's a, it's, it's a type of that uh, you know uh, healthcare but that's not what ayurveda dealt with alone uh, in fact ayurveda uh, the uh, ayurveda uh, deals with an approach of life and living guided by three uh, desires uh, that exist within a human being the first one is pranayashana that is desire to live uh, desire for life actually long and healthy life the second is uh, dhanishana right that is desire to gain wealth money monetary aspects and you know material life as well and uh, third one is uh, from the paraloka paraloka perspective that is after life right so it's a very holistic uh, approach towards life uh, you know everything from what you eat uh you know the the physical side of things the nutrients uh it's understanding the the balance of various doshas uh within you tridosha it has the concept of tridosha uh, vata pitta and kapha right so based on that um you know uh the medicine would vary the nutrition that you intake should vary so it's it's a very very complex uh, science uh unfortunately or maybe for you know unfortunately probably people have not really delved much deeper into it or maybe have got the complete uh you know understanding of this uh, right because i was speaking to a person who is in the ayurveda segment and today we get all these ayurvedic tablets etc but they're not purely ayurvedic because they don't take into consideration your individual um you know tridosha into perspective or the balance of your body right so that's a very very important aspect towards ayurveda right so when it comes to the modern context uh you know holistic health and wellness uh, medicine nutrition diet um, biology even aspects of psychology would all you know uh, come within the purview of ayurveda so we have some very very famous uh, you know uh, texts uh, in this segment that is charaka samhita sushruta samhita this ashtanga hridayam uh, bhava prakash which is slightly lesser known work but that's also important uh, book within the ayurveda segment right uh another very beautiful uh you know um i would say a knowledge uh discipline which existed in the indic society uh 
unfortunately it had got lost for the long 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 duration of time uh, but was rediscovered around the 19 or the early 20th century 1905 by shama shastri that is kautilya's artha shastra so back in the day the idea was that the indians uh, are only you know very spiritual or they uh, reality of things reality of daily life right so to speak so the discovery of artha shastra played a very very important role in bridging this gap and uh, letting everyone know that actually even the uh, the early indic society the ancient indic society organization looked at uh, economics politics and state welfare as a very very important field uh, right so there are a couple of uh, you know lines quotes uh, you know that that have been shared which has been mentioned uh, you know if you can take something like this you know prathame na jita vidya dvitiya na jita dhanam tritiya na jitam punyam chaturthe kim karishyati so today we have uh, Uh, you know i i i saw uh, i i follow a lot of business leaders as well so you know jack ma had a very famous article uh, you know uh, interview uh, that pretty much a lot of people might have followed by said you know the first 20 years of your life you should uh, dedicate to learning education and then the next 10 years uh, work for the boss who actually can teach you things and then focus on you know doing something between 30 to 40 what you want to do and then go into a mentorship role right This is very similar to what you know. Let's say Kautilya said in Sattva Shastra, "Prathame Najita Vidya." So, first twenty twenty years of your life, you focus on education. "Dvitiyam uh, Najitam Dhanam." In the next twenty years, focus on acquiring wealth. "Tritiyam Najitam Punyam." Then you focus on uh, your deeds, your karma, right? Uh, because if you do not do that, then what will you do in the last twenty years? This is the uh, the way he uh, said it, but what he implied is. Uh, you know, first twenty years towards learning, next twenty towards acquiring wealth, and then towards uh, punya, right? So that that is the way you need to look at this, right? So Artha Shastra discusses in great detail uh, principles of public administration, uh, politics, uh, you know, the uh, the council of ministers or the machinery of government itself, uh, and it it shows a very very close integration and. Uh, synchronization between economics and politics or public administration right and gives an idea of a welfare state as well so this is what actually artha shastra uh, deals with right uh, kautilya equates um, political governance very closely with economical governance as well right so that's a very close uh, understanding that that we had uh even aspects like uh, taxation in law and order trade warfare these are some of the other aspects that can be drawn from the uh, the artha shastra of uh, kautilya so there are, there are other books as well uh, neeti sada of uh, kamandaki aniti uh, vakya uh, vakyamrita of soma deshwara manusmriti all these also come under the artha shastra itself uh, right again very important aspects anyone who is uh, interested in taking up uh, you know life in public administration uh, should definitely be uh, you know looking at studying the artha shastra's model because it also gives the qualities of a king and you know um, the the social welfare is at the very heart of artha shastra as well uh, there are some interesting research articles that you can find on this so one of the painful aspects about uh, you know uh, the indic knowledge depositories that you know uh, artha shastra was written uh, approximately 2000 years ago uh, but we only got hold of this only during the uh, the last 100 years uh, right so there was a huge gap uh, during this time where we lost access to a lot of knowledge so that is the state that currently is as well there are plenty of uh, manuscripts and texts which which are there to be mined and explored and derive the knowledge out of but you know uh, due to lack of maybe interest or um promoting uh, such such a scheme that is not happening uh, but yeah definitely you know i see a lot of people interested towards this and there's a renaissance of things that is actually happening so definitely would uh, would be great if some of you can take up some of these studies of uh, various of uh, these disciplines uh, the final one uh, we dealt a lot with um i would say you know 
the the proper sciences there's also vedic aesthetics which looked at art as a science uh, right so there's this beautiful uh, shloka from uh, dvanya loka uh, which says apare kavya samsare kavire ka prajapati yathasme rochate vishvam tatevam parivartate so for a uh, poet you know poet is a brahma he you know uh, he equates poet to a brahma because uh, in a poem he can pretty much do whatever he wants he is a creator he can beautify something he can glorify something he can say whatever he wants to do in that so he is like a prajapati so this can be actually equated towards other art forms as well uh, right be it a painter you know uh the painter is he is the creator of his own painting whatever he wants to see whatever he wants to convey uh, he can do it beautifully using a particular painting so in sanskrit literature uh, and vedic literature we have exhaustive works uh, about principles concepts of beauty aesthetics aesthetic experience style process of creativity uh, so typically you know uh, art is considered more of a you know Uh, art is considered uh, maybe not science you know it's it's more natural is is what we think uh, vedic aesthetics looks at it more from a scientific perspective it it gives philosophical foundations as to how you feel let's say when when you watch a particular movie or when you watch a play uh, just you know when a particular scene happens when you feel emotionally happy when do you when you feel sad it gives a philosophy behind that as well uh and gives the science behind that right so it's a very very interesting take we have some amazing theories like the dhvani theory or the rasa theory uh there's alankara shastra there's uh you know vakrati theory uh this concept of sphota uh which is used in film making today the flash theory right that there are amazing works even in this particular segment uh the most detailed or the exhaustive work in this uh, is the natya shastra of bharata Uh, which deals with everything from natya kavya nritya uh, all the aspects sangeeta etc etc right and what is uh, what we need to understand from a modern perspective is each of these uh, ideas are universal in the sense that what is applicable to poetry could also be applied to sculpting or you know uh, painting etc right Uh, maybe this nuance was lost because of the style of writing the indic uh, the sutra system was very concise very formula based right now if i go and tell uh, a fifth standard student uh, you know that um, the theory of uh, the theory of relativity can be summed up with one equation e is equal to mc square he might not understand what that means right maybe uh, a 10th standard student might tell me that okay you know uh, in e is equal to mc square m is a mass and c is the speed uh, you know uh, the speed of light etc uh, e is equal to energy whatever you know the the uh, he can give me the the nomenclature but he might not know the depth of it right so only let's say a scientist might go into the detail of what actually the implications of that are how it can be applied and things like that so this is where the little bit of the gap exists we have a lot of knowledge repository in our indic systems it is begging for people uh, with uh, modern um, technological analytical rational reasonable uh, you know uh, thinking to get into it and you know find out ways of how we can actually utilize it in a modern contemporary society right so saying that i would like to you know uh, conclude my talk um, thank you one and all for you know your patience and listening to me so now we are definitely open to some questions uh, just about have you know i guess 10 minutes of time 10 to 15 minutes of time so we can definitely take up some questions and then we can conclude the discussion so uh, amit ji or nikunj any of you can if you can help me with some of the questions yeah uh... amol arya ji had a question uh, that he said uh, he can't really put on chat so if he wants to ask it directly okay. this would be a good time amol arya ji are you there do you want to ask a question now you can unmute yourself and ask uh, no question okay you don't have a sir. question okay okay I have a one question regarding. No questions, sir. Hello. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, go ahead. I have a one question about Anvik Shikha. I have heard this uh, uh, word in uh, uh, this uh, uh, Chanakya's Earth Shastra, but I couldn't uh, elaborate on it. I couldn't understand it. What it uh, comprises? So, can you uh, give some uh, insights over that? Uh, I, I didn't uh, catch the question. Could you please repeat it for me? Chanakya's Earth Shastra starts with uh, one word, Anvikshiki. It focuses more on uh, Anvikshiki. Anvikshiki. The art of thinking, the Anvikshiki. Anvikshiki so, is a generic term used in many of the Shastras uh, for the yes, process yes. of thinking. So it is not uh, just about Artha Shastra, but about Nyaya also we could say it is called Anvikshiki. Uh, Tarka Shastra is also called Anvikshiki. Mimamsa also has principles of Anvikshiki. So anything where you do logical reasoning uh, and thinking is called Anvikshiki, where you critically examine something from different points of view and you try to uh, logically arrive at some conclusion, that process can be called Anvikshiki. And uh, in general, all the Shastras have Vyakrana and Nyaya as their foundation. So the way the Shastras are presented, discussed in the Bhashyas and uh, in the various uh, uh, the, the parampara of uh, discussion and debate is using principles of uh, Nyaya and Anvikshiki. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bharatji, there were a couple of questions. Uh, one was whether uh, uh, Shaivism and Vaishnavism is which darshana. So I clarified that uh, there are a lot of uh, belief systems beyond what is uh, presented today as part of the core Vedic system, including uh, Agamic uh, uh, belief systems, uh, Pauranic belief systems, Shakta sure. belief systems, etc. So there are many sure. such things. So, Shaivism, Vaishnavism, etc. Uh, so, in, in the course of today's discussion, we have looked at uh, you know more from uh, a modern perspective. Uh, so, we have not covered aspects of uh, Itihasa, Dharma Shastras, Puranas, etc. Uh, so, these have more of a, uh, a religious, spiritual kind of a context. While they, they are relevant, um, but uh, yeah, we have not covered uh, today in that sense because um, we need to look at Vedas from a different uh, lenses. So, you know, I was told that the Vedic knowledge can be looked at from three levels. The one is, you know, maybe a direct, uh, you know, uh, translation. And then once you start understanding the Vedangas and the Darshanas, you have a different perspective. And then once you read the Puranas, Itihasas, etc., then you actually have another perspective towards the same knowledge base, right? So, yeah, there are different systems. Uh, so, we have not gone into greater depth of uh, the Puranas, Smriti, Sitihasas and Dharma Shastras. We have stuck more towards the ones that have a more, uh, you know, application from a modern context and a contemporary society perspective into consideration for today's discussion. Maybe it is, uh, you know, a talk for another day uh, that, that we can definitely have. Yeah, uh, there is a question on Bauddha Darshana for schools that again is, uh, I think, beyond the scope of today's discussion. Um, so we will uh, leave it at that. There was one more question about uh, uh, a reference for the Vedic philosophy psychology that you mentioned. What is the text that can be studied to learn more about the Vedic thinking on mind and cognitive thinking, etc.? So I think you had mentioned a couple of granthas. If you can show that slide again on Vedic philosophy yeah. psychology, uh, the yoga system. Yeah, so I'll take up both actually, even the first part, uh, the Buddhism bit. So, uh, like I said, it's it's a philosophical system that, uh, you know, uh, arised uh, based on, you know, um, based on uh, basically a system of idealism. Buddhism is a system of idealism. Uh, but there are a lot of details probably which I need to give you before I explain what Buddhism uh, essence, in the essence stands for. But it's a system that, uh, you know, uh, believes that uh, the, the source of plurality of this world is uh, neither one nor many, right? It's, um, it's, it's just everything is in transitory motion, uh, right? It doesn't, it doesn't last. Everything is in, in transit at all points of time, uh, right? So that's, that's the context of uh, Buddhism. So there is a very 
great debate that has happened uh, of uh, you know buddhist with uh, vedanta philosophy and also with nyaya philosophy so for nyaya the main opponents are uh, baudas uh, right and again you know for uh, vedanta as well uh, right so these 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 are discussions that that are that, that are documented there are a lot of books uh, if you read with respect to uh, you know these these topics you'll find you know when you take up nyaya or when you take up uh, vedanta uh, you you'll see a lot of discussion coming in from the buddhas because uh, about that because they are the ones that actually opposed a lot of the uh, philosophical aspects there uh, coming to the 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 yoga side of things so like i said there are yoga is a very very extensive uh, uh, you know uh, subject so the basic one is definitely the yoga uh, the yoga sutras of patanjali uh, it's just about i think 192 sutras or so is what it is made up of uh, then you have the bhashya written by vyasa then gheranda samhita uh, there's also yoga vashishta uh, then hatha yoga pradipika deals mainly with the asana side of things um, right so these are some of the most uh, prominent books from a yoga perspective but there there are plenty of other books as well uh you know i could probably you know have this sent across uh, over an email or so uh, for your reference but these are the ones that you can can definitely get uh, started with we also had a very beautiful talk on uh, indic psychology just a couple of weeks back by uh, uh you know uh, mr sagar vidwans uh, who is a professor at the mit school of vedic sciences i think the talk is available on uh youtube uh, so if you can you know uh, listen to it i think uh, uh, you'll get a lot more context of what actually vedic psychology is all about correct right. yeah that's a good point so the uh, youtube channel of iit uh, roorkee sanskrit club uh, has the will have the recordings of all these sessions and also the recording link as well as the presentation and the feedback form would be mailed to all the registered participants in a day or two by the organizers so do watch out for that if any of you have not yet not yet registered uh, you can register it i will type the url in the chat uh, so you can do that to be uh, informed about uh, future uh, talks in this series so uh, with there's that there's one interesting question uh, yeah, yeah just last question i'll just take up and then we'll wind up there's a very interesting question ayush has asked that you know the description of astika and nastika there's a term accepting the vedas as pramana please elaborate this concept This is actually a very good question, a very important question as well, uh, right? So, the the entire uh, Indian philosophical system developed uh, because of you know let's say some of the questions, the opposition towards the ritualistic uh, nature of the Vedas, right? Like I said, you know, Vedas inherently are a ritualistic culture. It had a lot of yajnas, performance of rituals, samskaras, you know. uh nitya naimitika all these the lot of uh, things that you have to do uh upakarma uh, you know etc etc that plenty of things so when the opposition started coming in philosophies developed uh, you know to the to protect the authority of the vedas now when i say authority of the vedas what we are essentially trying to say is that veda is the ultimate source of knowledge each and every sentence of the vedas is meaningful uh it has uh, knowledge it has uh, importance and it is basically describing uh, a law of nature or universe that exists right which cannot be changed it is apaurusheya and it is nitya it is eternal right so that is the context in which uh, these six philosophical systems are developed so each of these systems sankhya yoga nyaya vaisheshika purvamamsa uttara mimamsa uh they accept veda as a valid source of gaining knowledge right whatever is there as a veda vakya it's true that is what is is been accepted and whatever opposition uh, or questions that have been raised they have been able to answer it based on the presuppositions that they have and the world view that they have built using those presuppositions right so that is where we are saying that they accept vedas as a pramana pramana is what pramana translates to an instrument or a source of knowing knowledge that's a pramana it's an instrument right so veda is a pramana means veda is a source of gaining right knowledge so the 
Astika Darshanas accept yoga as a pramana. And the, uh, the Jainism, Buddhism, and Chadwaka system, they do not accept yoga as a, as a valid source of gaining knowledge. So that is the differentiation that comes into the picture. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, one uh, last comment. Uh, this is Badri here. I'm a participant, but uh, this, the I am uh, I want to address that question on Anvikshiki because I had earlier uh, attended a class on Arthashastra uh, okay. delivered by Professor Sankar Narayanan, uh, uh, HOD of uh, Sanskrit Department in Kanchipuram. Uh, he mentioned that Anvikshiki in Arthashastra refers to Sankhya Yoga and Nyaya uh, Darshana. Uh, specific to Arthashastra. So I was just referring to my notes from there. I think it is there in the in the Bhashya. I think it is there. It is actually dealt, that topic is dealt with. Yes. I have not studied yeah, in yeah. detail so the Arthashastra, but it is mentioned actually. I, I recollect going through a phase uh, once. Yes. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to answer. Who I, I don't know who asked that question, but I took the notes. So I just referred to it and wanted to yes, present yes. it here. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, I should also mention that this uh, logically this presentation of today is uh, kind of like a sequel to the first uh, presentation which I made in this series. Uh, it builds on the, some of the concepts discussed there. So um, some of you may have already attended it. If not, uh, please go to the YouTube uh, channel and look at my presentation as well. It will give you a little more context and background to what was discussed today. Uh, also, hopefully we will do a third follow up uh, part of this uh, series about the foundation as uh, concepts for un understanding the Shastras, maybe in uh, um, about a month from now. Uh, hopefully I'll be doing that third part. So uh, this is in addition to the other uh, parallel streams where they will have talks on different uh, specific Shastras and uh, their modern uh, interpretations. Okay, uh, with that, I think I'll uh, 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 thank everyone for attending today and asking all the interesting questions. And thanks to the uh, speaker as well. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.